So, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have a very special webinar with a very special guest, Wolfram, who will be telling all of us all about how we can get much more hyperproductive. So, Wolfram, without further ado, uh, take it away. Okay. Um, first of all, this is, um, I'm a little nervous because um, this is a different kind of presentation than I do it normally. Normally I have a lot of interaction and stuff like this and just presenting the theory. Um, this time and that was our idea um, is not just showing <coughs> theory, but um, really go hands on how a very simple uh, critical chain implementation can look like, also a little with agile, but very little on the side. So this is really a hands-on. Therefore, you will see a lot of slides and screenshots, and maybe you can look at the recording afterwards to get all the details. So what is the idea behind this hands-on? It's not telling you theory, I think, and I saw a lot of known people here in the audience. Uh, so uh, many of you already know about the theory of critical chain and TUC and stuff like this. So that's not the part today. Today it's a part if you are a small company or a mid-sized company and you really want to implement TUC, CCPM as fast as possible, what are the most necessary steps you have to undertake so it works. So a little different than the other presentations. Um, I don't have to tell you anything about me. Huh? You know me, otherwise you just look in LinkedIn and you see what I've already done all the time. And we already had it. Um, there's a big need in the industry outside uh, to get faster and more productive uh, due all this uh, changes in the world. and. Um, What's typically done, and we already talked about this agile stuff, and if you ask agile guys, huh, you have to implement um, more methods, uh, you have to implement more roles. Um, cadences is very, very useful, they say, um, and in the end, it's more overhead. And very often, if you ask the wrong consultants, you get, oh, you have to reorganize the new stuff is value stream oriented working. And so you have to rearrange the teams so that the work is flowing perfectly. And um, um, I have to apologize a little. This is definitely not a way to get hyper productive because all additional stuff um, is in the end work you have to do. So it's all about focusing on flow and not adding something new. So this hands-on is not about adding much new stuff, but doing the right things right. So, um, and in the end, um, maybe you, yeah, I don't introduce myself, but in the end, in, in the whole working time, I was responsible for over 530 projects. And we did already over 42 implementations of TUC and critical chain still. Huh? So, and um, it's like raising children in the in the beginning. You have different ideas how to educate them and raise them. And after having two children, not much is left of it. Huh? So all just the practical stuff is left over. And that's the same if you do projects or implementations of critical chain. In the end, that is what I learned. It's not very much left over. So if you want to get reliable on due dates or quality, then the only possibility you have is you have to shorten your lead time. So if you shorten your lead time, you get a little more reserve at the end to deliver quality and that's it. And then you can also be due date reliable. <clears throat> so if you want to be reliable, you have to shorten your lead time. Uh, the other thing is if you need more projects, um, no additional methods help you a lot. The only thing you have to do is you have to reduce the average effort in the constraint. That's the only way 
you get more out of it. Of course, you can uh, hire more constrained people or resources, but, but that's expensive and takes long. So the only thing is uh, reduce the average effort in the constraint. So that are the two things left over. And now the people want to get agile or they get uh, digital transformation done or sustainable transformation, innovation, competitive edge increasing or stuff like this. And uh, that, that's the third thing. If you want to manage this top down, you won't be able. So if you really want to be agile and innovative and all the stuff around that, um, the people have to organize themselves. So, and these are the three things you can't negotiate. Huh? Um, if you want to get better, you have to do this. And now it's all about hmm, how to reach this. And um, I promised uh, to show you it all. So it can't be very much what you have to do. So the first thing is um, how to shorten lead time and reduce the average effort in the constraint. And that has to be done very fast, otherwise it won't work. And you know it's already, uh, you know Little's law already and Goldratt's law, and that's the key. And um, this is a, a collection of formulas every manager has to know. So Little's law and Goldratt's law, very simple um, uh, equations. And the left one, Little's law, is very, very known right now. So the, the lead time is proportional to work in progress divided by throughput. So if you reduce the work in progress, then the lead time of the remaining projects or items or orders uh, reduce it too. Very simple, but very often misunderstood or not uh, accepted, but it's a very linear way of um, improving lead time, time to market. And for me, it's the fastest known way ever. And um, no, it's not, um, not uh, the only thing you have to do because um, there is a minimum reachable lead time. So if you really want to get faster, you have to do more. But in the normal situation, if you cut lead uh, work, work in progress by half, um, then you typically get a speed up by 50%. So, and the other formula, very few known in the world, um, very contradictory to most of the management paradigms currently used is um, many people think the, the more effective every team is working, uh, the more output you will generate. But as you know, theory of constraints, it's not the case. There's always a constraint and only the constraint counts. So um, Goldratt's law simply means if you reduce the average effort in the constraint, then you get more throughput. That's it. Um, also very simple. The interesting part in this, um, in this equation is if you are able to reduce the average effort by 50%, then you get twice as much throughput. So it's a non-linear curve. Huh? The more average uh, effort you uh, can reduce, the higher the throughput will get. And the most interesting part is, if you reduce the work in progress on the left side, um, typically multitasking goes, goes down, uh, mistakes are going down, and uh, the average effort uh, is reduced a little, not very much, but, um, um, this already counts into the throughput, so the lead time uh, goes down again. So, and that's everything you have to know. And now, um, if you are now manager, what would be your most important thing to do is to reduce the work in progress. And um, that's the hands-on part, the hands-on part. Um, we experimented with different ways and there's classical critical chain approaches and um, in the end you have to do four things. You have to identify the constraint, of course. Hmm. Um, then you have to have some very, very simple project plans. 
Then you have to stagger the projects by the constraint. So the constraint is um, the, the most critical re resource or virtual constraint or whatever. And um, the point four is the most important one. You have to stop to work on all the projects that do not go through the constraint at that time. Very simple. Uh, everyone immediately understands. And now I just want to show you how it is done. And uh, for the uh, identify the constraints, that's already the most trickiest part in this. Huh? So there are different ways to do it. Um, and I think currently we think there are three ways and I just show you a few of them. So the, the free, everything starts of course with a project list. Um, so Art and uh, Adato uh, show, um, provided some screenshots and I show all the screenshots from Lynx because this is part of this presentation, show how the hands-on is working with Lynx. So it all starts with a project list and um, the, the, I think the most common way of identifying a constraint is if you already have a Lynx running, um, you put the projects in, you have very rough project plans and you see the resort loads uh, and um, typically you just uh, put in all projects with starting now. That's very important. Uh, so don't plan them to different times or something like that. Just put them in with start now and then you immediately see uh, if there is in the integration team a capacity of eight, then you see um, in November it starts uh, rising the, the load and the average load is uh, 133 percent. So this is most probable um, the constraint. So that is that is what many uh, companies are doing. Um, you can do it also with an Excel file, but if you have a tool like uh, Adato or Lynx at hand, you can do it in this too. So, but that's just one possibility. Another possibility is out of our perspective, if you if you talk with the people, um, very often they know about a critical phase in a project. So, and the critical phase is typically something where the senior staff is thinking about good solutions, how to solve a customer problem. So the conceptual phase, or it's very often after assembly or after building parts, the integration phase. So very often you don't have to look so deeply in where your constraint is, but you can simply define it um, as it is proposed in the critical chain world as the phase, the most critical phase in the project um, where you need the most experienced people and you don't know what, uh, you don't know who. So, and um, Adato is um, uh, providing a very simple concept uh, for, for, for approaching the project world like this. Um, sometimes we call it essential flow uh, um, because it is not a perfect real project planning at this time, but it's enough to really do the staggering and reduce the work in progress. In this table, you see simply uh, uh, an example of three projects, they have a priority. Um, and what is left? What, what do you really need? You need the time before the critical stage, the time in the critical phase, and the lag time afterwards. And that's already enough to find out the right amount of projects um, that that you can handle and reduce the work in progress. This table in Excel can be imported into Lynx, uh, and then you see the projects, the priority, the start end dates, and the three different tasks with their duration and the, the predecessors. So we simply use here a general import possibility of Adato to bring them in. And the result is uh, something like this. So you have a, um, a few on the projects with all the um, lead, critical and lags. Uh, 
um, everything starts in the beginning in this case. And uh, in the last column, you can even give them colors uh, so you can easily identify the priority or something like that. So, and um, that is already enough to do the work in progress reduction. Uh, important is the priority. Here, um, it was chosen in, in buckets, uh, 10, 20, uh, 50. I often prefer one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's a clear priority and that's it. So, and now the, the last, or not the last, but the, the most important part is the staggering. Um, and if you do it like this, in this very simple way, um, you don't you don't have the, uh, a clear understanding about the capacity of your critical phase. And very often, um, you already know how many projects can be in this phase. So uh, here you have a little to deal with gut feeling, but if you put the right people in the right room, then you can easily determine it. And if you do something wrong here, you will immediately see that the uh, resulting due dates are simply not as you um, understand it. So you can adjust it very simple. And the function for this is this scenario mode. Uh, you can adjust the capacity. You can build different uh, scenarios. The priority, you can adjust the priority. And the result is something like this. You get a staggered portfolio, so not like in the beginning, everything starts now, but now you see um, the, the light blue behind, that's the original planning, I think, and then you see that some of the projects are moved to the right with new due dates, uh, and that's the result of the staggering. Um, what you can do is change the capacity, you can change the priority until um, the senior staff and the experienced people say, Oh, this is a good work in progress. And typically our um, our proposal is if you think it's right, then you reduce the capacity by 20% again, huh? and, and then you get a real staggering. So keeping 20% of what you feel is right as protective capacity is a good stuff to start. And um, um, so now you have the, the real end dates. And that's the last and the most important part. You have to accept that some of the projects will become a little uh, in, in planning a little later. And these you, you won't work on, they have to be stopped. And we don't talk about stopping anymore. Uh, we, we typically are talking about paused because in the end, um, they, they are not stopped. They are just paused for a few, um, few weeks and um, if you have the project in the in the, the full project with capacity in links then you can check of course the average load and that's a, the only exceptions um, if you are in special machinery or, or something like that and you have to order some of the stuff um, you have to take care that you don't stop projects with uh, long running order items so you have simply to to finalize whatever is needed to um, to order this stuff, but directly after ordering, um, it's not allowed to work on this. So, and that's um, my hands-on. That's uh, the smallest or fastest way um, to reduce the work in progress. And you just have to ensure that on these three projects, no one is working anymore. And then they will run around and cry for work, of course. <laughs> and then, um, of course, you can ask, okay, can you help the other projects uh, prepare better um, or, or anything else? And that will, of course, increase the speed of the other projects. So um, that is part one of the hands on how to get hyper productive. And I think there are a few out of practice here in this round. Um, I have seen companies, even big companies doing this within a few days, huh? just putting all the projects together in a list, um, getting the overview where the constraint is, do the staggering, 
and then prohibit to work on all the stuff that's not allowed to work on. So, um, I currently rush a little huh, because our time is is a little tight, um, and um, um, I just want to give you an overview. You can recap all the stuff anytime. Um, a few of you, I think it was something around 11, uh, filled out this questionnaire I sent around. Uh, and in this questionnaire, we got some information. So now you see the data of your, uh, so it's, it's very usual data, so you are not very different than all the others. Um, but uh, in this questionnaire, um, you stated in average, that the reduction of 35% of lead time would be easy if the work in progress is reduced. I see these figures. Um, we have data from 650 companies right now. Very normal, so 35% reduction of lead time would be no problem. Um, so, and out of the question, we can calculate how severe your multitasking is. 10 is very bad. And also here you ever you scored very average. 7.4 is the average of all the companies we ever um, checked. You had you you got a 7.2, so that's that's easy. Um, but in this multitasking score, there's something in. So if you have 7.4, 7.2 multitasking, then it must be that you have too much work in project um currently running so 7.2 is not good um, we have now companies and when we do their multitasking after a while test uh, they reach three to four very very um common so the difference is to get the multitasking down and by reducing the multitasking and all the work in progress negative effects you as the ones who filled out the questionnaire said that 33% of the effort can be saved. So and now you calculate you know the, the, the calculation um, how much throughput this means. So it's something around 40-45% more throughput. So by reducing the work in progress and doing theory of constraints and all the stuff I showed right now, you can expect more projects done, only exception or uh, assumption is that the constraint is within your organization. And that's it. Huh? So um, doing this first four steps will lead to shorter lead time and to more throughput. Reliable. And I hope you saw it's not very hard and it does not take long. The only thing you have to do is staggering and stop the projects. And um, just a few numbers, huh? um, and you can look afterwards uh, in this. So we have a lot of examples how this really worked very fast. Um, so that were the, four, the, the first two things you have to do. Um, and the hands-on does not stop here. So the next very important step is to bring the people to self-organization, to manage themselves so that you as a boss, you don't have to run after each other. And um, it's all about bringing people to solve problems, take the responsibility. Um, and yes, it's part of the agility stuff. And you know critical chain, has a wonderful mechanism to do this. So if you have a project plan on the right top side, there's a green, uh, orange and a red work package and some deliveries, light blue and dark blue. Um, and what we typically do is we, we shorten the duration to get some buffer at the end. So, um, and that's, that's a mechanical uh, math uh, stuff. But uh, what we typically do is every day, the responsible person of a work package gives a feedback how long it takes to finish in good quality. So very simple. Um, and out of this, the famous fever curve is calculated. 
Uh, so on the x-axis, you see the progress. Uh, there are different uh, calculations for this, but in the end, it's always um, how much time is spent on the critical chain somehow. Um, and on the y-x, um, you see the buffer consumption. And for example, if in the green work packages, uh, one week, it takes one week longer, then of course uh, you don't generate progress but buffer consumption. And, and you see that in the fever curve that it goes north. And as long as you um, generate more progress than buffer consumption, everything is green. Yellow is some kind of a wake up area and red means that you have to recover buffer. So, and th that's, that's so simple and whether the calculation is perfect right or the estimations are perfect right, no one cares. Huh? It's, it's like um, the signal that shows everything. If it's perfect, don't care. And that's also a part of the hands-on. Most of the company think, oh, you have to have perfect project plans, but this is not the case. You can start with whatever plans you have, rough ones, detailed ones, good ones. They are never right. Huh? But if you really use the signal for managing, um, the ones working on the project are very interested in making their plans clean and right uh, to get resources. And then you will see after a while the right plans. So um, in the hands-on, uh, the projects are already in Lynx, but you need somehow a very, very rough project plan. And then you have to press a button uh, to get the buffers. Uh, that's all done automatically. Um, then uh, if you do it in a hands-on mode, you are not well prepared. Um, all the work packages that are able to start or in progress, you have to check whether a task manager is assigned. That is the one responsible giving the remaining duration every week, huh? uh, every week, every day, every day, every day. So, um, and that means you have to enforce this um, giving feedback. You have to check this. Uh, if someone is not giving the feedback, then he has a reason. So you have to help him. And um, typically it takes a week or so, or months, sometimes a little longer uh, than the project plans are cleaned up because the only condition you really have to meet is um, that the day-to-day uh, -day resource allocation is stoically done by the fever curve. So if two people are coming to you as task manager and uh, cry for resources, then you just have to go in the fever curves and the one with the red project wins and get the resource. Um, if the other says, oh, my project is even more critical, then he has, just has to go back to the computer, adjust the plan, clean it up. And if he then is more red than the other, then he get the resource. So this is the number four is a mechanism so that the project plans are cleaned up. And after a while, if the project plans are clean, then you see the real problems in the projects. Um, then it's all about buffer regain. And that is also a job done daily. Um, and then the system is up and running. So hands on, here it's a, it's a screenshot of a project plan um, like we did in the first round. And then you have, of course, put a project plan behind huh? because the, the three phases of staggering, that's not enough. Um, so you need a real project plan, but not much more than 10, 20 tasks. That's absolutely enough. Um, and Adato has a, a special feature. Um, you can even put um, uh, subtask cards below a work package. You even can connect it to Jira. So even agile guys working with Jira can work into this plan. And very often you have the detailed planning and just this in the middle is missing. So someone just has to put in the plan. Otherwise he won't get a color, not a fever curve. And without a fever curve, he won't get resources. So you have to be stoically in this. Uh, no fever curve, no color, no resources. And then they will immediately start putting project plans in. So, and uh, if you have the project plan in, 
And um, I don't have to tell you very much uh, about Lungs. That's a, a very simple plan with five work packages. So what we typically do, we reduce the duration by uh, to 66% down and half of it will get the buffer so that the uh, duration is in the end the same. So no one can complain. And uh, now you have uh, a buffered plan and Lynx can easily show the debuffered version. So if you talk with a customer or something like that, you can show them the debuffered version and internally you have a buffer. And that's a very cool feature. So there's no hurdle in buffering projects huh? because you simply can do it. It's, it's uh, um, transparent somehow. And now you have uh, the buffers. Uh, you have milestone buffer, feeding buffers, uh, project buffers, and then the stuff comes with the check of the task manager. So if you have a task overview and you have a, a web front end, you have an app front end, you have iPhone and Android, and I think I saw something like a Teams integration too. <laughs> so, so, so not far away, there will be also the possibility in, in Teams to give feedbacks uh, of durations. So, and the only thing you have to do on a more or less daily basis in the beginning is to check whether there's a task manager. You can use um, the definition of ready checks. Huh? And then after a while, you see all the task managers are done. And, and uh, that's a precondition for starting with the remaining duration. And then, um, you see uh, all your tasks as task manager. You can give here on the right side in the blue box the remaining duration feedback that is done every day. And if you have tasks cards below, um, you can even use a Kanban board uh, to get the remaining duration and stuff like this. There are different ways of doing it, but in the end we don't care. It's just about um delivering the remaining duration every day and you have reports to see uh, where the task manager is missing you have reports to see whether the um remaining duration is updated all the time i've never seen such a green uh, where every everyone is delivering uh, typically it starts with 10 percent uh, then in the next days uh, uh, it's going up to 30, 40 percent uh, not delivered uh, because the people don't believe that they have to deliver it every day. Then the, the leadership has to talk with some of the people. Sometimes it takes a little longer, a few weeks, but then they are typically around 20 percent uh, red, maximum 20 percent red. Uh, so 80 percent of the remaining durations is clear. And then the people start uh, trusting the fever curve um, and that's it. And the last thing in this section is, uh, this is a standard project, everything is fine. Um, the progress is 18%, everything is, is fine. You get the fever curve every day, every, everyone. And if it goes to red, they start buffer regain. And if you have buffer regain, then uh, typically, uh, the project manager is putting a buffer regain node uh, so that the, the, the management knows, okay, the team is already um, doing this stuff. Um, and then you get the final diagram. You get all your project as dots in the, in the fever chart, in the scatter plot. And that is uh, the only and the most important thing to do. Um, that is operational priority. So if someone comes with a red project and someone with a green project, the red project wins and you have to do this very stoically. If you, if you don't do it like this, all the other work you have done um, will degenerate. Uh, if you do it exactly like this in the beginning, it won't be right, but then the project plans are getting better, the buffer regain nodes are getting better, the remaining duration feedback is getting better. And so the organization learns after a while, in a few weeks, how to do critical chain. And the result of this is that you as top manager, you don't have to talk so much anymore. I know we have here in the round a few 
who already went through this process, they will say, oh, Wolfram, no, no, it's not like this. In the end, it's hard work to bring the project manager um, to show the, the wanted um, behavior, uh, solving problems, taking over. But this is leadership. Um, and with this tool, you have the perfect leadership tool. You know where to look at. And after a while, the people start to um, to behave in a way like uh, wanted, and then it's getting better and better for the for the management. So, huh. it, it was very hard for me because in the head it was very simple. Huh, this this presentation huh, because I I did it so many times, but. Um, if you write it down, then the hands on is still a little more than just a few points. So you see, uh, um, you have to do quite a few things. It's not very much, but you have to do it. And the last step, very important for the organization, is this uh, reducing the average effort in the constraint and before the constraint. And this is continuous improvement. Uh, and um, up to now, we are just focusing on the constraint that it's not overloaded, on the project that the fever curve is there, that the people cooperate. But now it's all about um, um, learning. Huh? So uh, very important are these buffer regain nodes. And every week, hopefully, you sit together and analyze um, the stuff. Um, to find root causes. So you have the buffer regain nodes here. Um, you have uh, very often um, an, a statistics about where the most buffer is consumed. And out of this, typically you do something like um, this, that you sit together define what were the root cause, what is the action. And this is top management priority to go through this every week um, and improve your processes. And if you do this, um, this is uh, the output um, of a company working with us. Um, it's a public data, so I can name it, it's mega. Um, and you see, on the x-axis, there are weeks. And um, the dark blue curve is the output of tasks per week. So and in the gray line, that was more or less a baseline. So the so Lynx was implemented and all the stuff uh, remaining duration. And that's that's more or less um, the, the baseline. So there was no big improvements in projects. It was just getting the system done. In the middle phase, huh, you had all this clean up of projects and, and stuff, training the people. And then you see in the productivity phase, then they started with this uh, process improvements, then all the stuff paid off. And now they have a task delivery rate five times higher than before. And after a while, huh, this pays off in the throughput of uh, the whole portfolio. So they have now something around three times, four times more project delivery than before. Just by doing what I've shown here. So, and um, that was a hands on how to implement critical chain. Now, just two small hands on um how to tell it to your boss huh? because maybe you are not the boss so you have someone to tell uh that it would be cool to do it and that's very simple hmm? and you don't have to understand everything on the left side huh? but in the end uh, with the questionnaire you found out that something around 50 percent more projects can be done huh? so you gave the numbers your people gave the numbers and in the end, it's very simple to do uh, throughput accounting and, and really understand what's the benefit, the business case out of this. So just an example. 
Um, if just uh, assume that this 50% out of the quiz questionnaire are real, huh? you won't be able to sell 50% more huh? as a company. So very often we simply ask then sales, okay, out of this additional throughput, how many can you sell? And maybe they say, okay, 20% is possible in the near future. And if you have 10 mil, uh, 100 million uh, sales huh, um, and 5 million bottom line, that's very, very usual figures. Huh? And maybe if you are doing mechatronic components, then the totally variable costs are something around 50%. So it's very easy to calculate the, your current balance sheet. Huh? So the, the 100 million you earn, you have to pay off 50% 50, 50 of this, 50 millions for, um, for uh, supplier and material and licenses and stuff. And if just 5 millions are left over bottom line, then you must have operational expenses of $45 million. It's very simple. So and now if you, if you can sell 20% um, more, huh, then you can, you, you simply get 10, 10 millions more because 50% are totally variable cost. Operational expenses does not change. So with selling 20% more, based on the theory of constraints, this is just an example. Um, you can triple the bottom line. And you can imagine we had, we had customer um, with this calculation, even if not, if you if just selling 10% more, they had a, a business case of $300,000 $300, a day. So, and then it's no big discussion for a boss anymore to say yes. So, and this calculation, if you are a consultant, if you are in a company, you really have to understand this. Um, what is the bottom line effect of theory of constraints? And you have to do it in while sleeping without problem. So, and then you have the okay of your boss. And then the last hands on I have for you, and then I'll finish. If the boss says, okay, I want to do 50% more projects, your colleagues are typically the ones um, you don't have on board. So how to get them on board? And what we found out that they are already on board. Huh? No one wants to work in an overloaded organization. No one wants to be uh, uncooperative. So what we typically do is uh, we call it challenging workshop. Um, we don't tell the companies what they have to do, but we show them the hands on the methods and they have to say why it's not working. And then everyone comes up with the obstacles. We help them to sort them. Um, and then we ask, okay, guys, why are you, are you working here? And that was for me a big eye opener. Um, everyone who's working, who's coming every day to a company, managers, they, they have an idea why they are coming there. And it's not just the money. It's very often the products or something else what, what they feel important. And if you as a manager see how you can improve easily um, your processes, your organization, get more done of what you really love, then it's very simple um, to get them on board because after doing this exercise, it's the first time that they understand how easily they can change to a better world to get more of what they really want. And then they are in. And a few of you already remember this. At the end of our workshops, we ask the go chart. And it's on the y axis from bottom to top. Um, just the feeling where the people are standing towards the change. And on the on the lowest level is, oh, we have no problem. So we have full resistance. And then the, the higher up you come, uh, the, the more the people are convinced that it's a good idea. So the next step is, yes, we have a problem, but the solution, uh, what we talked about is wrong. 
Uh, and then the next level is, okay, we have a problem, the solution, uh, it can be solved, uh, but the solution is wrong. Uh, then that's a special one someone put on, not now. Uh, and after the red line, it's yes, critical chain is the solution. Okay, we have to deal with some details, uh, but we should do it. And there are always a few uh, really, really convinced we have to start tomorrow. And it's it's not a, a special example. We do this with different companies for a long time. And here it's just a collection of go charts. I have much more. And you always see uh, most of uh, the people, the managers after this workshops are on go. But there's always one huh? Or, or very typically there's one saying, oh, no, no, that's that's a critical one. Uh, so we have to talk with them. But you see, after doing this, hands not the hands on, but the preparation uh, with the business case and the challenging workshop, you typically have a chart like this. And with this chart, the middle manager go to the top management and ask for the permission to go. So, and that is the last summary slide. So if you really want to get hyper productive, it's not much to do. Huh? Um, and there are companies around, they manage to do it in 50 hours or something like that. Work hours, not time hours. So you have to reduce the work in progress, easy. Huh? Um, you have to have this uh, self-organization fever curve, easy. Huh? You have to really work on process improvements, easy. Uh, with a business case, it's easy to tell the boss. And with a challenging workshop, it's easy to get your colleagues on board. And with Lynx, uh, you saw the screenshots. It's also not a big effort uh, because everything is there. Um, it's very easy. E even if you have Agile and Jira, you can connect it. We, as Dolphins, we provide, of course, a way and support in these workshops. Um, and my offer to you is, uh, you, you already had this link to do this um, small questionnaire and you get a PDF with your numbers and uh, Excel to calculate the business case. Um, um, but I think what we Dolphins can provide is a good step into this analysis and the first workshops. And I think Lynx and Adato um, would also be proud to support with tooling. So thank you to all. That was a, a special way of showing you how easy it can be to get hyper productive in a very short time. Thanks a lot. <laughs>